Open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 15, if you would. Judges chapter 15. And uh, I'm going to talk about a guy that you might remember from your days in your children's Sunday school class who was a tough guy. Chapter 15. And go down with me to verse number 9. And if you were there, say amen. amen. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner. They answered, to do to him as he did to us. Now, this is, this is kind of the thing. Um, he did to them as they had done to him. Now, they want to do to him as he did to them. I'm so glad Jesus taught us to, to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And that's just a little side note here. Um, Verse 11, then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answer. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. Now, there's something noble about that that I think the men of Judah missed. Samson didn't want to fight his own people. And if they had any intentions of harming him, he was going to have to defend himself against his own people. But they promised that we'll only tie you up, hand you over to the Philistines, we will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lahai, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax like a charred wick and the bindings dropped from his hands finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey he grabbed it now if you've never seen a jawbone of a donkey it's kind of, it's pretty big and it's kind of a big curved bone and and you know probably still has some teeth in it and finding, the jaw, finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. And when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone and the place was called Ramath. Lehi or Ramoth Lehi, uh, because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. And then Samson drank, or when Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So the spring was called in Hakor, and it is still there in Lahai at the time the writer wrote this. And verse 20, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So when he had finished, he threw this jawbone away, and the place was called Ramath Lehi. And I want to point out that 
the, in Hebrew, Lahai means jawbone. And so Ramoth Lahai means the hill of the jawbone or simply jawbone hill. And so that's where I'm taking my title from today. I want to talk to you and preach on the subject of Jawbone Hill. Jawbone Hill. It is the place of this incredible battle where one man defeated a thousand with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey for a weapon. So would you bow your heads and hearts with me and let me say a prayer. Father, I thank you for your presence that we feel in this place. I thank you that you love us and that you have sent your son to die for our sins to save us. I thank you that you never leave us. You are with us through every battle that we will ever face. And God, today I pray that you will just add your blessing to the reading of your word and that your anointing would rest upon me as I speak your message to your people. And let all who hear this message be blessed by it and changed by it. And let your word serve your good purpose and not return to you void. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray this. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, I believe it was in the fall or winter of 1991, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, that I first applied to work in law enforcement many years ago. And one of the things that I had to do to get hired on at the department, uh, in fact, they, they wanted me to be the chaplain there. I was pastoring a church in the city, and, and to be a chaplain at this particular department, I had to be a sworn police officer. And so I signed up to go through the training. Well, the first thing to do, um, I had to go before... Uh, an oral review board and it was a panel you know what I'm talking about brother Richard he it was a, a panel of uh, officers you know of different ranks I think there was just a, a rank and file patrol officer or two and there was a sergeant or two and a lieutenant or two maybe even a captain but um, there was there was this one older uh, black gentleman on this panel that I think was a lieutenant. He might have been a, a captain, but I think he was a lieutenant. And uh, I don't know how old he was, but he looked like he'd been a policeman for a long time. And the, uh, the members of the panel would, would sort of present a scenario and then ask me questions about how I would handle that if I was faced with that scenario. And so you just had to give answers off the cuff, off the top of your head. And, well, when they came to this one older gentleman I'm talking about, um, he, he asked a question I wasn't really expecting at all. He looked at me and he said, uh, preacher? And none of them had called me that. So that was a clue to me. This guy goes to church, probably. I don't know. He said, preacher, I see here on your application that you're a pastor. And... Uh, he said, how do you feel carrying a gun? I mean, how would you feel if you had to use a gun since you're a preacher? And I really wasn't expecting that question, so I just answered sort of just right off the cuff. I mean, what first came to my mind, and I said, well, Samson carried the jawbone of a donkey, so I guess I can carry a thirty-eight." And I immediately saw the reaction of all the faces on the panel. And I thought, you know, he might be the only one that went to Sunday school. <laughs> the rest of them were like, what? What did he say? It's like, what? <laughs> but this one, old, this one old man on the panel I'm talking about, he just kind of, when I said that, he just looked at me and nodded his head. And he said, well, all right then. He looked at the rest of them, gave the affirmative head nod and and uh, I thought, well, I guess I answered that one right. Every time I read this story about Samson, I think about that experience from so many years ago in my life. But uh, how many of you remember Samson in the Bible? Raise your hand. If you've you heard about him, he was a tough guy. Well, I, when I was young, when I was a young man, I, I was pretty tough. And, you know, I used to do things real physical. I lifted weights. I rode bikes. And I, I used to be pretty tough. In fact, I was pretty tough all the time. And in pretty much every situation. And as I've gotten older, I've 
come to realize I'm probably only tough sometimes, depending on the situation. <laughs> and I used to joke with the younger men that I supervised. Um, I used to tell them when they'd get to picking at me and I was their lieutenant, I would say, uh, look, I'm still tough enough to whip a young man once and once is all I need. And but as I've gotten older, I think, you know, I better quit joking that way. Somebody's going to take me up on it. I'm going to embarrass myself or hurt myself because I'm just not as tough as I used to be. But, you know, nobody wants to be identified as weak. And especially so when we're talking about spiritual weakness. <coughs> Excuse me. We, we like to think that I've prayed up and I've fasted and I've prepared and I'm tough and I'm spiritually tough and, and you know, if, if the devil better not mess with me because I can whip any demon that wants to fight. We, we think, you know, we quote the scriptures, if God is for me, who can be against me? Yeah. If, you know, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me. Yeah. Y'all been to that church. Shall prosper. And we just think we're pretty tough. And then one day something happens. We have what I call a 1 Corinthians 10, 12 problem. And y'all, some of you have heard me refer to this problem. It's where, it's where the writer of Corinthians said, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I mean, you, you've got your feet firmly planted in the faith one minute, and then the next thing you know, you feel like Samson after a bad haircut. Right? I was, you know, that was the source of his great strength. I, I was a youth pastor when I got started in ministry, and I kind of had some long hair back then. It was fashionable. And I remember this one dear old lady came up to me after church and said, Brother Todd, would you like me to cut that hair for you? And I, I said, oh, no, ma'am. You never know when you're going to run into a bunch of Philistines and you might need it. And she just kind of looked at me and grinned like, well, he got me. <laughs> and, you know, when we were kids <clears throat> and we heard the stories of his great strength, we all wanted to be like Samson when we grew up, right? Right. But as I've gotten older and I've read the rest of the story of Samson, I've decided that maybe I don't want to be much like him at all in the end. You know, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow once said, great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. And it's been pointed out that, you know, Samson's life is really a perfect example of a life that begins well, but doesn't end very well. And we read in Ecclesiastes, the end of the matter is better than its beginning. And I think that might be perhaps what he was talking about, that it really doesn't matter as much how you begin as it is how you end. And, and so to be very clear about this, uh, Samson made a lot of bad choices that led to a very unfortunate ending to the story of his life. But today I want to focus on one battle that he fought that ended well. And it's the battle that took place on a hill called Jawbone Hill, literally. And Ramath Lehi. And all of us, I think, can have a battle like this one. And there are some important lessons that we need to learn to help us when we find ourselves at just such a place as this, a place like Jawbone Hill. I want to begin by giving you some background to the story. And remember, this is during the time of the judges. And as you may recall, that's when God's people had no king. And the Bible says every, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so I want to focus first on the people of Judah and just give you some insight into, into and by the way, these, these are Samson's people. So, so as I talk about the people of Judah, understand these are Samson's people. This, these are his own people. 
And these are the people of God. And I'm, I like to give little mini titles to the sub parts, the various parts of my message, my sermon. And so and it, I think it helps me and it helps you to maybe apply it uh, to your life. And so I'm going to call this part choosing sides. Because I think every one of us will come to a point in our life where we have to choose where we're going to stand on something. But one of the amazing things to me in this story is how the people of Judah, the very people God called Samson to deliver, chose sides with the enemy. Did you see that in the story as I read it? They chose the side of the Philistines. Um, you see, the Philistines had, had been evil to God's people and especially to the man that God called to, de to deliver his people, Samson. And I didn't read the, the, the back story to this, but if you take the time to read it, they had used Samson's wife against him. Now, I'm not even talking about Delilah. She comes along later. But Samson had this wife, and, and they threatened to, the Philistines threatened to burn her and her father's household to death if she didn't cooperate with them and, and you know, try to find out from her husband what his source of his strength was. And God, you know, he, was an, he had this vow with God. God had blessed him with his strength. He was never to cut his hair. And uh, so she had to choose sides. So the first, first person we see choosing sides here is really his own wife. They turned her against her own husband to try to find out what the source of his great strength was. And then after the enemy had used her, in fact, I love how Samson reacted to it. They figured out his riddle based on her information she had obtained by whining to Samson that you don't really love me. And so when they finally used his wife and Samson realized that, he said, well, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have figured out my riddle. <laughs> so husbands, do not go home and call your wives that. <laughs> But, but after the enemy used her, it's in the Bible, y'all. I'm just quoting scripture here. After the enemy used her, they took her away from Samson and gave her to the friend who had attended Samson at his own wedding. And so at the time of the harvest, Samson decided to do unto them as they had done unto him. And the Bible tells us he caught 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail in pairs. He fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and set the foxes loose in the fields of the Philistines to burn their grain crops. And it was right as they were about to harvest the grain. So the Philistines took Samson's wife and her father and burned them to death. So Samson said, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until, I've, until I get my revenge on you. Tells us, it tells us that he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. And then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. And so that's the backstory. And so the Philistines, they, they knew that Samson somehow had this unnatural strength. And he was someone that they didn't feel they could defeat. And he didn't any longer have a wife that they could go after. And so this time they decided to go after his people, the people of Judah, his own family. And notice with me in verses, starting in verse 9 there, when the men of Judah found out about this, uh, and when they found out that it was really Samson that the Philistines wanted, they said, why have you come to fight against us? They said, we want Samson. And when they found out it was really Samson they wanted, they had to choose sides. And they decided to help out the Philistines. Now, this is amazing to me. Watch this. They even rallied together an army of 3,000 people. And they could have used that army to fight against the Philistines. But instead, they used that 3,000 
man army to fight for the Philistines against their own God-given leader, one of their own people, Samson. So it was, <clears throat> they, they helped the enemy. They, they were faced with a conflict in which they had to choose sides, and they chose the side of the enemy. And now, it's been said that a nation is in a sad state, when in, indeed, when the citizens cooperate with the enemy and hand over their own God-appointed leader. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I... I believe every one of us will at some point in our life face a battle in which ethics and morals and, if I may use this word, convictions will call upon us to have to choose sides. The Bible is very clear that as we live in this world, there are two masters and you cannot serve two masters at the same time. And so we, we will all face times of decision where we must choose a side and get on it. I'm not talking about straddling a fence. I'm talking about making a decision. I mean, it's, you know, just, just before the time of the judges were the days of Joshua. And, and if you, I mean, the book of Judges just kind of picks up where the book of Joshua ends. And if you look at the end, over toward the end of the, of the book of Joshua, at the end of his days of leadership, he's the one who said, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefather, that your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you know what that meant? That meant if you're going to live in my house and sit at my table and eat my food, you're going to go to church with me. <laughs> yeah, let, me let me preach that just a minute. I've never seen the like of children choosing where the family gets to go to church because they get candy at that church. <laughs> Boy, when I was at church, I was lucky to get half a piece of that double mint gum mixed with some purse fuzz from my mama's purse. We didn't, I didn't get to pick where we went to church or if we went to church. That was a parental decision. But that's not in my notes. I digress. And so and even, even to the church in Laodicea, you know what Jesus said to them? He said, I know your deeds. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. And so because you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. See, God doesn't want people who try to straddle fences. God wants you, he's going to, you're going to be presented with decisions in your lifetime and you're going to have to choose right from wrong, righteousness from unrighteousness, holiness from unholiness. You're going to have to choose the side of this master or that master and you're going to have to get on that side because if you're on the fence, guess what? You're not on this right side. And so we're, we will face battles in which we have to choose where we'll stand. You'll have to choose a side and get on it and take your stand. And you know, that means that there are some battles you cannot be silent in. There are some battles you can't just say, well, I'm, I'm just going to stay neutral. There are just going to be some battles in which even the decision to be silent or to stand in neutrality means you have chosen a side. And so this is a decision, I'm just going to say this, that you better have made long before the Philistines come and camp in your Judah. Every one of God's people need to do the hard work of carving out your own convictions. I'm talking about convictions of what God considers to be right or wrong. Young people listening to me, you need to settle it in your heart what is considered moral or immoral in the eyes of God. And better if you do that before that issue presents itself to you. 
You need to choose this day whom you will serve. So the men of Judah rallied an army of 3,000 men. And they could have used that army to fight the enemy, but when they heard that it was really Samson they wanted, they decided to help the enemy. So they went down to where Samson was and said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. But they chose the side of the enemy. Listen, let me, let me, let me tell you something I've learned. You know, sometimes you, you don't know what to do. But one thing I have learned is you pretty much always know what's right. And the advice that somebody gave me many years ago that stuck with me, and I give it out all the time, whether people want it or not. When you don't know what to do, do what's right. Because all of us pretty much know what's right. And I'm going to tell you something else you need to get out of this. Um, when you, when you do what's right, sometimes you'll be, you'll be by yourself. Not one of those 3,000 men said, I'll help you, Samson. I would rather fight my battles alone than fight with an army on the wrong side of the battle. In fact, sometimes when you choose the right side, you will stand on, and you stand on the Lord's side, you will absolutely stand alone. And even I thought about the fact that even as Samson fought the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, the story in no way suggests that anyone in the army of Judah ever picked up the weapon of a fallen Philistine to help Samson in the fight. They just stood there and watched. And I believe God is calling some people of this next generation to choose their side. God's calling you. you. You know the right thing to do. You know he's calling you out from your lukewarm walk. He's calling some people to be on fire, hot and not cold. I'd rather fight my battles alone than fight with an army that's fighting the wrong battle. And sometimes... You fight the right battle alone, but fight it. So choose your sides. Second thing I want to talk about. Let me talk about this, and I'm going to call this part choosing your weapon. Choosing your weapon. <clears throat> and I want to point out that uh, it's a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Samson had a choice to make. He could fight against the men of Judah or he could surrender to them and ultimately fight the right battle against the Philistines. And so he allowed them to tie him up with these two new ropes. They led him out to where the Philistines were encamped. It says as they approached the uh, area of Lehi, the Philistines came out shouting. And by the way, that's important that you understand something here if you're facing a battle today. If you're facing your spiritual enemy you, you need to get this. Nobody likes it when their enemy rejoices over them. Maybe some of you haven't experienced that like I have, but I've had people who don't like me and they rejoice when I look like I'm defeated. Here stood Samson bound with two new ropes before his enemy. They came out shouting with joy. Do you know why they did that? Do you know why they were shouting with joy, it's because to them he looked defeated. He looked like he was bound. And I want to tell you, so does your spiritual enemy rejoice when you look defeated. But I love the part of the story where it says the spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. And suddenly those ropes became like charred flax and the bindings just dropped from his hands. I've got good news for people who are facing battles. When you look defeated, things are not always as they seem. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I just, when Jesus died on the cross, you know, he looked defeated to a lot of people. They mocked him. They said, oh, he could save others, but he can't save himself. Huh. If you're who you claim you are, come on down from the cross. I mean, I imagine hell rejoiced when Jesus died on the cross and the earth, but 
things were not as they seemed and Jesus was not defeated. He was busy conquering death, hell, and the grave. And, and I bet when they were rejoicing in hell as he died on the cross, I bet just a few moments later when he walked in and demanded the keys to the kingdom, I bet nobody in hell was rejoicing. You, 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 you're supposed to be dead. You, we, you, we saw you hanging on a cross and, and you look defeated. But you, you understand, you may feel bound and defeated standing before your enemy. But I've come to declare that the spirit of the Lord has come upon you in power. Amen. When you gave your heart to Jesus, the spirit of God took up dwelling inside you. You became the temple of the living God. Amen. And when the spirit of the Lord comes upon you, the ropes that seem to bind you become like charred flax. And they rejoiced because they thought he was defeated, but Samson was not defeated. He was just getting ready to conquer. And so I would, I would have loved to have seen the look on their faces when suddenly the ropes they had bound him with became like charred flax. Poof. Now there he stood on a hill, unbound. And maybe the enemy thought, well, at least he's unarmed. And we're armed. He has no weapon. But finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Notice the word fresh here, a fresh jawbone. If it had been a, an old dried out bone, it would have been more brittle. Old dried out bones are brittle. Don't look at your neighbor and say, well, he's preaching to you. <laughs> but it just so happens. Now, now, follow me. It just so, what a coincidence. It just so happens that laying right next to Samson was the remains of a freshly killed and perhaps half-eaten donkey. There may have even still been some meat on that bone. And I, I bet there were certainly some, still some teeth attached to this jawbone. And there was nothing else lying around for him to use. And so he used what was laying right there on the ground. What are the odds that at the very place where he faced the fight, a place at Lehi, which by the way means jawbone in Hebrew, what are the odds that at a place called Jawbone Hill, there just so happens to be a fresh jawbone of a donkey laying right there? What a coincidence. You've heard me say this. When things are such a coincidence, it's probably not a coincidence. He saw it, and he thought to himself, that'll do just fine. And so he grabbed it. I've got to tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? When, when Tommy and I, my brother and I were little, we had some cousins, and uh, one or two of them could kind of be a bully. I won't say which cousins. I love all of my cousins. We're all grown now. We're all old now. <laughs> but <clears throat> uh, I think it was, I might have been me that he was picking on. I don't know. I was kind of the the young one and the little one, but my dad had given my brother some advice because, you know, the cousin was bigger and stronger. And my dad, in his parental wisdom, said to my brother, Tommy, sometimes you have to pick up something to even up the fight. Well, sometime later, we were visiting my cousins, and this was back in the day when they made toys out of metal. I mean, they weren't concerned about kids hurting themselves with toys. They were made out of metal. And my cousin started in, and here, here we go. And my brother looks around to see what he could find. And since there was no jawbone of a donkey laying there, there was one of those toy irons, you know, like you iron clothes with, made out of metal, had a real cord attached. My brother picked that up. He started slinging that around by the cord and whack right on the back of my cousin who immediately, you know, starts screaming and all the parents rush into the room and, and my dad looks at my brother and my brother looks up at him and says, I did what you told me to do, daddy. <laughs> oh. I, well, let, let me just teach you something here about choosing. That's where I'm going with this, choosing your weapon. I just want to tell you something. 
Just when you face the fight that's before you, God will always provide you with a weapon. Hallelujah. It may not be the, the weapon you would choose or what you would like to have. You may feel under-equipped and ill-prepared for what you're facing, but God will always arm you for the fight. God will always provide you with something to use in the fight. I mean, when he called Moses and Moses said, I can't do this, God said, what do you have in your hand? He said, a staff. He said, that's what I'm going to use. When, when David, you know, heard the, the taunts of Goliath and they tried to give him a sword and armor and he said, I can't use these. I haven't tried them. I haven't proved them. But I do have a sling. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that God will always give you a weapon. There, there will be that somewhere in your battles, you're facing your struggles in life that you face. You see that fight ahead of you. You, you need to start looking around. There will be a jawbone of prayer laying there somewhere. I mean, you need to pick that up and start slinging it. There will be a jawbone of fasting or a jawbone of scripture laying around. Just, just pick it up and start using it. And maybe, maybe you need to pick up on the word fresh. Maybe you need a fresh jawbone, a fresh prayer life, or, or a fresh time with God in Scripture. But, but God will give you a weapon to use in your fight. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. We have spiritual weapons that God has given us to use. And it will always be made available to you when you're facing the fight. So choose your weapon. And lastly, I want to talk about drinking from the caller's spring. When the fight was over and he'd struck down a thousand, Samson said with a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys of them. It says when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone and the place was called Ramoth Lehi, which is Jawbone Hill. It was an incredible victory of one man against a thousand with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. But then in verses 18 and 19, we find that after the battle, Samson was so thirsty that he thought he might die. In fact, the King James Version here says he was sore athirst. <laughs> and it's a Probably not a good translation. He was sore a thirst. Sore is not, it's kind of an old English word. It means very much so. And that's exactly what the Hebrew means here, vehemently, very much so. But I like the word sore because have you ever been so thirsty your throat is actually kind of sore? And he, he says, you've given me, your servant, this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the rest of these uncircumcised Philistines. And, and let me just say that God has not given you the great victory. Listen, listen, listen to me. If you're facing a battle, God has not given you great victories throughout your life just so you can now die of thirst. Just to let you be defeated after the battle of your life is over. And, and some Bible scholars see this as the testing after the triumph. The idea is that after we've won great victories, God will often humble us and remind us that we're still really weak and dependent upon him. And I see that in there. I mean, Paul talked about that to keep me from being puffed up with pride and all these revelations. He said that the Lord gave me a thorn in my side, a messenger of Satan to beat me. And the Bible says that God answered his prayer. He opened up a hollow place in Lahai and water came out of it and Samson drank. His strength returned and he revived and the spring was called in Hakor and it is still there in Lahai. There, there are a couple of things I see here. In Hakor, first of all, I believe that after the battle is over, often there will be a time of refreshing. 
And so I just want to say to someone, your time of refreshing is coming. But secondly, notice the name of the spring. It was called Inhakor, which means the spring of the one who calls on God. Or simply put in Hebrew, the caller's spring. And the message to us here is, when you're thirsty, call on God. Be the caller. God, God wants you to be a caller, someone who really knows how to pray, and He really does hear you, and He really does answer prayer, and you know, He can give you water to drink to satisfy the thirst of your soul like nothing else can. I preached just recently about Jacob's well and the Samaritan woman that Jesus met there. If you had known who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and I would have given you water to drink from so that you would never thirst again. He's talking about the thirst of the soul. And so when you call to God, there is a caller's spring that he will give you. Isn't that good? What an incredible story. The fight at Jawbone Hill. Before you ever face the fight, choose your side. Know, know what you stand for. You can't serve two masters. Choose today whom you will serve. And when the battle comes, remember that it's always better to fight the battle alone on the right side than with an army on the wrong side. And if you're facing a fight today, maybe you need a fresh jawbone. God always will provide you with a weapon that you need. Look around, pick it up, pick up that jawbone and start using it. And then when you're really tired and thirsty, because battles can, even spiritual battles we face through life can leave you pretty drained. Be the caller. God will give you the caller spring to refresh your spirit and strengthen your soul. And that's what we learn from the battle, the fight at Jawbone Hill. Boy, sometimes I feel like I'm standing right there on that hill. <laughs> I've had situations in life where it's like, here we go again. I've learned to start looking around. There's gotta be a weapon here somewhere. I remember years ago facing a battle and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. As soon as I became aware that it, the battle was in front of me. He said, this is a spiritual battle. And I immediately picked up my jawbone. I started fasting. That moment, I said, well, I'm starting to fast right now, Lord. And get in the habit of that. Isn't God good? He'll deliver you. He'll get you through. Listen, you accept Jesus as your Savior. He will get you through the battles of this life. He, he is able to keep that which you have committed to Him until that day, what day? The day he comes and gets us out of this crazy place. And he's gonna take us home and he knows how to save his own. Would you stand with me? And the people that are watching our program, I, I, I call on you to accept Jesus as your savior. If you never have, this is the day. Choose what side you're standing on today and, and pray and ask Jesus into your heart and message me and I'll pray for you. To those of us in this congregation, hang on. Don't be overcome in the fight. God's got this. Stand firm on that hill. You know what side you're on, and God will provide whatever you need to fight it with. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you today for these people. I thank you for all who have heard this message. I pray, God, that you will let this word take root in us and encourage us. I pray, God, for those facing battles, whatever it may be, whatever they're praying for, let them hold on to that weapon and, and use it skillfully. Give them the strength, God. You're the one who gives the strength to use it. I pray, God, that people will choose the right side and they'll remain faithful in the fight and that you will give them a great victory and refresh their soul, renew their strength, I pray, from the well of the caller. Let them call on you. Hallelujah. Father, I pray that you 
Give these people your favor. Bless them, Lord, and let your face shine upon them. We give you praise and glory. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that we ask these things. And everybody said, Amen.